Um, I haven't been able to be back to State of the Map since 2014, so it's lovely to be here again, uh, and thank you for inviting me to speak. I'd like to do just a quick bit of housekeeping before I get started. Um, the full title of this talk uh, is Who's on First, colon, fist bump, colon, open street map, where the colon, fist bump, colon part is meant to be a mock emoji shortcode. Uh, there is no emoji for fist bump yet, but I'm hoping there will be soon. Uh, now that uh, left facing fist and right facing fist have been added to Unicode 10, all that's necessary for a fist bump emoji is a combining character. On the other hand, not many operating systems have adopted Unicode 10 yet, which is why I included a fake emoji shortcode in the talk proposal. For example, the last slide I just showed was an image because I prepared this talk on a different computer, and the laptop I brought to the conference still can't display Unicode 10 characters. So somewhere between submitting this talk for consideration and its inclusion in the conference, the title was lost in translation. Uh, instead of newly minted Unicode characters, which would almost certainly not render on most people's screens and probably not at the printer, uh, or the fake emoji shortcode, the decision was made to use the common and more readily available oncoming fist character. Uh, and I'm not really bothered with that, except to point out that the title takes on a slightly more threatening and even hostile tone than I ever intended. So for the record, punching OSM is not what I had in mind. This is more what I had in mind. Uh, and if anyone doesn't know what going, what's going on here, this is two people dressed up as the Wonder Twins. Uh, the Wonder Twins were a Saturday morning, uh, they're Saturday morning cartoon characters, part of the Super Friends uh, who battled for good and justice alongside more readily uh, familiar characters such as Batman and Wonder Woman. And the Wonder Twins would activate their superpowers by fist bumping each other, upon which each sibling would transform into complementary objects. And perhaps the most famous and ridiculous pairing saw one twin become a giant eagle, which carried the other who had transformed into a bucket of water. Uh, and the 70s were weird like that in a way that we don't have time to talk about today. <laughs> Except to say that who's on first would like to be the bucket of water to OSM's eagle. OK, who's on first? Um, Who's on first is a gazetteer. And if you've never heard the term gazetteer before, the easiest way to think about it is that it's a giant phone book. But it's a big phone book of places rather than people. And I'm going to spend most of this talk talking about uh, venues. And Who's on first has been around for about two and a half years, which means something on the order of 40,000 words of theory and engineering decisions have been written. So I'm not going to talk about that. But what I would like to do is spend a moment and do a high-level overview of the project to describe the shape of the elephant, so to speak. To begin with, Who's on First is an openly licensed data set. At its most restrictive, data is published under a Creative Commons by attribution license. Wherever possible, and this is true of our own day-to-day -day work at MAPSN, work is published under a Creative Commons Zero public domain license. Every record in Who's on First has a stable, permanent, and unique numeric identifier. There are no semantics encoded in those IDs. At rest, every record is stored as a plain text GeoJSON file. Our goal is to ensure that Who's on First embodies the principles of portability, durability, and longevity. And this led us to adopt plain vanilla text files as the base unit of delivery. Files are stored in a nested hierarchy of directories derived from their IDs. And there are a common set of properties applied to all records, which may be supplemented by an arbitrary number of additional properties specific to that place. There are also a finite number of place types in Who's on First. And all records share a common set of ancestors. As with properties, any given record may have as complex a hierarchy as circumstances demand, but what's important is that there's a shared baseline hierarchy across the entire data set. Individual records may have multiple geometries, multiple hierarchies, sometimes both. 
And records can be updated, superseded, cessated, and sometimes even deprecated. But what's important is that once a record is created, it can never be removed or replaced. And most importantly, by design, Who's On First is meant to accommodate all of the places. Who's On First is not meant to be a carefully selected list of important or relevant places. It is not meant to be the threshold by which places are measured. It is, we hope, meant to be the raw material by which many thresholds might be created. From Who's On First's perspective, the point is not whether a place is important or relevant, whether the place exists anymore, or whether its existence is even disputed. What's relevant for Who's On First critically is that people believe those places to exist or have existed. This is why I sometimes refer to Who's On First as a gazetteer of consensual hallucinations. Um, this will start animating in a moment, hopefully. This is work uh, that my colleague Stephen Epps did earlier this year to create and link all of the records representing the many ways that the place we used to call Yugoslavia has changed between the start of the 20th century and now. Oh good, it's working. Um, right? One of the ways I talk about this is Sarajevo in 1998 is quantifiably different than Sarajevo in 1993 than it is in 2017. And I'm gonna let this slide run on a loop while I discuss a point some of you may have tweaked to in the last slide. Specifically that OpenStreetMap and Who's On First have sufficiently different licensing requirements that it prevents data exchange in both directions. Now, I just said license, which means somebody somewhere has one OSM bingo. But more seriously, I'd like to make one thing perfectly clear before I go on. I am not here either as an employee of MapZen or an individual to ask or suggest in any way that OpenStreetMap revisit the decision to adopt the ODBL. My personal feeling is that OpenStreetMap, by having accomplished the impossible in 13 short years, has earned the right to do whatever it wants. If OpenStreetMap chooses to have the ODBL, that's fine with me. At the same time, I need and want an openly licensed database of locations that can be used and adopted in both commercial and closed projects without any restrictions beyond attribution. This is the space that Who's On First occupies. And that is why we will not, we cannot, import data from OSM. So about this time, two years ago, I had a little freak out at work. We had been discussing the availability and viability of open venue data sets. And the reason I freaked out is that when you take OSM off the table, for all the reasons I've just discussed, there are effectively no openly licensed data sets for venues. And I was starting to wonder what we were talking about. Accurate and up-to-date venue data is a difficult and daunting challenge. There are a few companies that have built successful businesses collecting and reselling that data under terms which can only be described as a Faustian bargain. Other companies like Facebook have amassed similar and sometimes superior catalogs of data almost by accident as a byproduct of the, their day-to-day -day work. So far though, none of these companies has seen fit to share any of that data. Which leaves two alternatives. The first is the gaping void of nothingness that we've all come to know and, and love. And the second is to embrace the idea that something is better than nothing and that something which can be improved upon over time is even better than that. To embrace or at least accept that our burden in the near term, and this is the burden we are gonna have to carry uh, for the foreseeable future, is one of managing absence. That in addition to all of the hard work collecting, vetting, and improving data, we will also need to think about ways that we talk to people about the data we don't have and to develop interfaces for buffering and tempering that absence. This makes an already daunting project exhausting even to think about. 
The good news is that there is, in fact, one open database that was available for use in 2005 for venues. In 2010, the geoservices company Simple Geo published their Places database containing 21 million business listings under a Creative Commons Zero public domain license. Now, the company uh, went out of business shortly after that, but not before Jason Scott um, <laughs> of archive team fame managed to grab a copy of the data and put it on the archive. There's a cautionary tale there, but that's another story. So the first thing to know about the simple geodata is that it is a flawed data set. For starters, it is almost eight years out of date. Now, that's what we say, but when we say things are out of date, what we're really saying is there's no new stuff. And when we say there's no new stuff, what we're often really saying is there's no new stuff for a particular kind of business, typically those focused on snacking, grooming, and nesting, and aimed at a particular demographic, 18 to 35-year-olds with disposable income. But the funny thing is, is that lots of businesses survive longer than 17 years. Think of the butcher that's been in your town for the last 75 or 80 years. We could go on. And, if we're lucky, sooner or later we all get older and eventually need to call a plumber, an electrician, a notary, that kind of thing. Now that's the stuff that's in the simple geodata set. So to say that it's out of date has always struck me as somewhat inaccurate and unfair. Now, the data is heavily slanted towards the US. 60% of the venues in the simple geodata set are, are from the US. Um, and Simple Geo claimed that the data covered 60 countries, but that's really disingenuous when you consider that all but about a dozen countries have fewer than 100 venues in them. It's also heavily weighted towards professional services. There are a lot of CPAs and a lot of doctors and a lot of lawyers. And to be honest, the sheer volume can make it difficult to see the trees of the forest. There is some genuinely bad data. But there's no surprises there, and I think few among us in this room would be the first to cast a, the, the first stone when it comes to bad data. We've all been there. There is minimal structured relational data. For example, the only way to find records for a given locality or neighborhood is to load everything into a database and start performing spatial queries. And everything was published as a single line-separated GeoJSON file all 21 million records. And if I had been at Simple Geo at the same time, I might have done the same thing. As a consumer, that decision has been nothing but 100% sad making. But it's a good start. And the first thing we did was to explode that 21 million line text file into 21 million discrete records, each with a new who's on first ID. If nothing else, the data has proven its value in forcing us to think about how, from a purely operational point of view, we manage editing, storing, and distributing that much data. Without getting into all the details, I'll just say that trying to put 21 million files in a single Git repository remains challenging enough as to be impossible. And simply having 21 million files on a single volume in 2017 still causes people to run out of inodes and try explaining that to someone who doesn't understand or care about file systems. But there are more than 21 million venues in the world and we're gonna have to figure these things out eventually so we might as well start now. And this is what it looks like. And if all the venues in the world weren't enough we also want to be able to track historical venues. So let's pretend that Who's On First existed in 1985, and a writer has published a review of the Palace Steakhouse associating this Who's On First ID with their article. It is important to us that both the author and the readers of that article can rely on that ID forever with the confidence that its meaning won't change 
even though the Palace Steakhouse went out of business in 2009, and that space has been occupied by three different restaurants since then. The second thing we did was to assign each venue a hierarchy with pointers to all the other places in who's on first that the venue holds hands with. Um, this is what I mean when I was talking about the difficulty of working with the simple geo data as is and only being able to do spatial queries. By adding the hierarchy, what we do is we make it possible to find all the venues in a neighborhood, in this case the mission, with nothing more than a two-part key value query. And so sometimes I've described who's on first as really just a fancy accounting tool, um, which doesn't sound that exciting, but it's kind of a big deal. Because what it does is it lowers the barrier to entry for people to be able to do something with the data. And it's early days, um, but we are also starting to do the work to track brands, assigning them each their own stable IDs and static records. This is extraordinarily primitive work right now and relies entirely on unsophisticated string matching, but it's something to build on. And one of the medium-term goals we have is to work with actual brands and have them contribute and then take responsibility for maintaining their venues inside of who's on first. We'll see if that works, but it's good to have goals. In addition to static downloads, everything is available through the Maps and Places API. Um, it takes about five minutes to grab all 76,000 venues in San Francisco and dump them out as a GeoJSON feature collection. And I could have easily spent the entire talk discussing the UI and UX challenges around editing the, exi the existing data and making it fast and easy to add new data. The OpenStreetMap community really should be commended on the work they've done in that respect. Um, we are a small team, and so our biggest challenge is simply the short number of hours in the day. This is work by another colleague named Dan Pfeiffer um, to think about how we might use geotagged photos to add new venues to who's on first. The reason we did this is that Dan spent the summer in uh, Korea and Taiwan, places where we have no venue data, and where all of MapZen services like tiles and web-based APIs grind to a screeching halt and become unusable when you're traveling on a throttled data plan. So what Dan's tool allows him to do is roam freely during the day taking pictures quickly of venues, points of interest. He told me he took a lot of pictures of signage. Uh, and then uploading them after the fact to create new records in who's on first. Finally, we've been working with Al Barentine, who wrote the Lib Postal Address Parser. Building on that work, we've asked Al to take a first pass at address deduplication. So if address parsing is where you go to cry, address deduplication is where you go to give up. But as we go forward and start to import newer data sets, it's clear that the first challenge we're going to have every single time is reconciling what we already have and who's on first with whatever new offering is on the table. So we don't have the luxury of giving up on the problem of address deduplication. Um, Al's remit was not to solve all the things, but to create a viable 1.0 tool that demonstrated tangible results and can be improved on going forward. Uh, the tool is called Lie, um, and as with LibPostal, it's available as open source software. Um, and while Al was building this, I was testing things on the usual suspects, New York, San Francisco, LA, and London. Um, and one of the benefits of Al's software is that when we establish a match between our venues and an official listing, so this is public data from all of these cities. We can flag that venue as current, and we can remove some of the ambiguity that has surrounded it, some of the ambiguity that's sort of built into the idea of taking a random data set of 20 million, 21 million places off the internet. And we can add concordances from who's on, back, who's on first back to the city and their venue records. We want to hold hands with everybody. Um, and the next step, as we get ready to finish up this phase of work, is to deduplicate who's on first against itself and to clean up the data even more. It's the last slide. Um, and one of the things that's nice about the software is that it's able to work with fuzzy and approximate 
location data for venues. For example, it's possible to use the latitude and longitude for the postal code associated with an address in the absence of coordinate data for that address itself, and the software will still find successful matches. What that means concretely is that basically every health and safety inspection record ever published in the US is now fair game for address deduplication, which is kind of cool. If anyone's ever looked at it, that's the one that everyone talks about, like, we'll just get it from the health inspectors, and you look at the data and you're like, there's no coordinate data. So what that means is we can validate records that we already have and start to import new ones with a high, if not perfect, degree of confidence and begin to start chipping away at the no new, no new stuff problem. So, lastly, some of you may be wondering what this has to do with OpenStreetMap. And the honest answer is, I don't know, but something I hope. If Who's On First can't use OSM data, then we would like to make sure that it's easy for the OpenStreetMap community, if and when it chooses, to use our data. Maybe that means all we do is establish concordances between our venues and your venues, and maybe it means something more. My hope at the end of this talk is that I have raised enough interest and enough questions that we might answer the question together. Thank you. Any questions? The short answer is yes. Uh, the question was, have we looked at open addresses for concordances? Yes. So how do you, Aaron, how do you prevent, um, or do you even care if there is a, a, like a cannibalistic relationship develops between who's on first and OSM, meaning that basically kind of the data that you generate continues to thrive within OSM and not in, who, in who's on first. Do you care about this or do you see it as a challenge? I, so I, I don't see it as a challenge. I see it, um, I would love it if the data made its way into OpenStreetMap because then it would be available for all the people using OpenStreetMap for all of their tools. Um, it's, and, and again, I mean, I just want to reiterate, the, the issue is not asking OpenStreetMap to change the license. It's just that the decision that the community made to adopt the ODBL is problematic for some projects, and that's where Who's On First fits in. And if we can, if we can shuttle the data back to you, great. Hey, uh, going back to your Yugoslavia slide, are you saying that in, are you saying that Yugoslavia would be a record in who's on first? Yes, it would be a record and it would have a cessation date and it would be superseded by whichever was the next Yugoslavia. And would you try to go back to like more historical things like the Holy Roman Empire or like the USSR or something? The short answer is yes. The longer answer is um, we don't have time to work on that uh, day to day. So from an engineering and an architectural perspective, we've tried to set things up so that that will come naturally and be easy for people when we get there. But yeah, there's a bunch of history buffs on the team. And like, what about like, uh, maybe like indigenous areas, like the Iroquois nation or like Navajo type areas and stuff like that? Yes. That's pretty cool. Thank you very much. All right, so...